just entered the theater of an alien sky. If the words and images seem strange to you, there's a reason for this. Our world was once a vastly different place. To experience this won't hurt you, and there is nothing to fear. In our previous episode, we considered the Egyptian stories of creation. An original unity named as the god Atum gave way to a separation a division into regions above and below. But lacking any concrete referent, most translators render the two regions vaguely as heaven and earth, or heaven resting on an ambiguous horizon, or twin-peaked mountain. Global variations on the ancient theme repeat this remarkable idea, and innumerable interpretations of the theme have been published in both popular and academic media. Under the common interpretation, the ancient language itself is left permanently obscure, whereas in the most ancient sources, highly concrete forms and a spectacular shift in the cosmic environment are consistently emphasized. In this series of discourses, we follow a different line of interpretation. We connect ancient myths and global symbols to extraordinary formations in the sky. The so-called creation has long been misunderstood. Creation was a remembered event when visible powers revered as gods appeared to construct a vast habitation in the heavens. In the language of the myths, an emergence occurred a differentiation and clarification of form where no form previously existed. The language for the original condition typically emphasizes chaos, not in the usual meaning of that term today, but in the sense of dimness, fog or clouds, celestial waters, a pre-dawn glow, no implication of turbulence, no hint of conflict or wars of the gods, all of which came later. The first meaning of the word chaos was formless. In the Egyptian stories, the creator Atum was immersed in the boundless waters of the deep, originally inactive and lacking any distinctive form. Then in the acts of creation, he acquired external limbs through the explosive ejection of visible outflow called words of power. The texts say the God gave birth to himself through this acquisition of external form. More specifically, as we've noted in our reconstruction of these events, this form was provided by the God's lower limbs, his resting place, his perch, the cosmic pillar. The pillar is, in fact, a centerpiece of antique creation stories, and it connects us to the archetypal substructure, a foundational human experience from which all of the ancient cultures arose. It's here that we encounter the so-called separation of heaven and earth. The words are all too familiar, but nothing close to an explanation or even an accurate use of words has ever appeared in scholarly studies of this theme. We've offered a testable explanation in our historical reconstruction. Based on the earliest astronomical traditions, it begins with an ancient gathering of planets close to the Earth. We've called this planetary assembly the polar configuration, and our claim is that the early cultures recorded its distinctive forms with every tool available to them, long before a language of stable planetary motions was even possible. Given the specificity of our visual reconstruction, it can be readily tested against a vast cross-cultural consensus. The cosmic mountain or pillar consistently meant the resting place of a visible power remembered the world over as the creator. The figure named also as a primeval sun and identified in the early astronomical traditions as the planet Saturn. 
But in the prior historic context, the monumental cultures knew these powers simply as the ruling gods. So as we've seen, the Egyptian priests could declare the great God lives fixed in the middle of the sky upon his support. And this central power, Autumn, could announce with perfect consistency, I am raised aloft on my perch above yonder places of the abyss. In the original mythic context, the abyss meant the cosmic waters, the primeval ocean of Nu, the very waters penetrated by the cosmic pillar to give Atum both his resting place and his external form. In our reconstruction, it is the crescent arms of the pillar god standing out in a critical phase of the polar configuration that visually divided the great sphere of Saturn into upper and lower regions. By following that surprising conclusion, the ancient sources will never disappoint us. And so we find in this archaic symbolism the origins of the Atlas theme, a theme coming down to us in many variations. But here too, conventional treatments of the subject lack any content in actual experience. That's why the ground we've covered in earlier discourses is so essential. In the daily revolution of this crescent, we see the original form of the cosmic twins. Just as the twins to the left and right signified contrasting positions of the crescent in the daily cycle, so did the symbolism of above and below in the same cycle of an archaic day and night. Here we discovered the archetypal meaning of the Egyptian words Nater Ta, the divine land, God's land, designated as two lands, more accurately, the twin lands, since as we should expect, this symbolism is inseparable from that of the cosmic twins we've also discussed. In this case, the emphasis is on the revolving crescent positions above and below in the daily cycle. In Egypt, the meaning of these opposing crescent positions was localized in the symbolism of Upper and Lower Egypt. The original inspiration lay not in terrestrial context, but in sacred cosmography, symbolically projected onto geography. The cosmic map of a holy land in the sky was the prototype, reflected in sacred temples, cities, and kingdoms on earth, always directing our attention back to the twin powers of heaven. The celestial model was by no means limited to Egypt. All mythic archetypes traced to a unified source, sometimes complex, but always leaving an imprint, a signature, a fundamental and lasting contribution to human thought and religious practices the world over. For the Sumerians and Babylonians, the agent of the cosmic separation was the giant Enlil, in a fashion eerily similar to that of the Egyptian Shu, Enlil divided a primeval unity into two regions, one above, one below. The word for that unity was Anki, a combination of the very words for above and below, on the above and Ki the below. As in the story of the pillar god Shu, the Sumerian priest declared that it was the pillar god Enlil that separated On and Ki. This curious theme is well worth following. How did it happen that in so many creation accounts the world over, a fabulous pillar arises to separate an original unity into upper and lower divisions? Such memories coming down to us from every corner of the ancient world can only reinforce our conclusion that the mythic archetypes originated in an unfamiliar world, virtually no connection whatsoever to the celestial environment we experience today. In all of this, a key consideration must be driven home. The ancient star worshipers did not just see a giant sphere in the heavens above them, 
They did not just see a heaven-reaching column appearing to hold that sphere aloft. The polar configuration had a central definition, including the vertical column's universal link to a revolving crescent. Follow today's common assumptions and the entire idea of such a concrete global theme is preposterous. And yet, as we explore the ancient context, letting words mean what they say, the implications become ever more clear. 